I'd like to address the following question. Is there a moral right of secession? Now, my answer to that probably won't surprise many of you. There is. But I'd like to begin by considering why the question itself is an important one. First of all, the question whether there's a right of secession has real practical significance. The world of politics forces decisions on us. States are made, and they're remade. And as we watch states being made and remade, we have to decide, as individuals, what attitude we'll adopt towards these events. Do people struggling for their independence have a right to do so? Do states have a right to attempt to crush persons' attempts to seek their own freedom? Even if we decide to ignore events like this, we've implicitly taken a position on it. We've implicitly adopted an attitude towards it. So again then, politics forces us to, in one way or another, consider this question. But the question also has real philosophical importance. The basic question of political philosophy is this. What is the moral basis of the state's authority? Is there any such thing as a legitimate state? In the history of modern political thought, three basic kinds of answers have been given to that question. The first is found in the writings of John Locke, the English political philosopher, uh, who in his book, uh, Two Treatises of Government, published in 1690, argued that legitimate political authority is founded on the consent of the governed. Now, right of secession challenges this position. If it says that a group of persons who have given their consent to be governed by political authority may legitimately withdraw their consent in order to form a new political unit. A century later, the Scottish philosopher, philosopher David Hume argued that we owe allegiance to government, we have a duty to obey government, because government is useful to us. Government is useful when it produces order, order which facilitates our pursuit of self-chosen ends. But a right of secession challenges this position as well. If it tells us that a group of persons may withdraw from a state in order to form a new one that they find more useful than the one that presently governs them. And a third argument is found in the, the, the writings of a German philosopher, Immanuel Kant. Kant argued that if the policies, if the laws of a state could, in principle, command universal agreement, that is, among the citizens subject to them, then we can say that that is a just state. Its justice is what gives it authority over the persons it governs. But a right of secession challenges this position too. If it enables people to claim the moral right to withdraw from even a just state. So the right of secession then is an important philosophical issue because it requires us to rethink various answers that have been given to the basic problem of political theory. It requires us to add qualifications to our views about why the state can have the authority to govern. So contemporary political philosophers should be looking at uh, the issue of secession. Strangely enough, they're not. When I decided to write a paper on secession, I was stunned uh, by, by the, the dearth of material, uh, you know, ethical material available on the subject of secession. I found uh, one uh, important work uh, written by a philosopher named Alan Buchanan, a book entitled Secession. And uh, I am going to, later on, uh, towards the end of my talk, uh, comment on some of his, uh, his ideas. But I want to divide my talk up into three parts. Uh, first, I want to... Uh, advance certain moral considerations that support a right of secession. Secondly, I want to define the right and detail any limits on the exercise of the right. And then finally, I'll conclude by, uh, by looking at some of the uh, objections that might be raised against a moral right of secession. Okay, so to begin with, uh, I want to start out by asking this. What do we mean when we, when we say that something is a good or a value? This is, is relevant to our subject because we're going to ask, what is the, the value or the good of political order? We can begin by saying this, that our ideas of what is valuable to us or good to us are what motivate us to act. They're what give us uh, reasons to do things, to realize our goals, to make things happen. Now, there are, there are, there are a great many uh, answers that philosophers have given to this question about what is good, what is valuable, and so on. I just want to look at how we describe what is valuable or what is good. And we can divide answers up into two basic kinds. The first says that values or goods are personal or agent relative in character. What that means is, is that anything that is a good or a value is a value for some particular person. Very clearly this tells us why values motivate us to act. If something is a value for me, it gives me motivation to pursue it. 
It gives me a reason to try and make it happen. When social scientists uh, study human behavior, uh, an agent relative conception of value is what, uh, what they have in mind. And certainly economics, which is the most sophisticated of social sciences, uh, very explicitly uh, has developed an agent relative conception of value. We can also say that this, this appeals to common sense. We do things because we want to do them, because we find them good or we find them valuable. But there is another, uh, another conception of value. Uh, which, uh, according to which, value is impersonal or agent neutral in character. Now, there are, there are a great many versions of this, but we can, we can say that they share the following feature. They all say that we must value certain things. There are certain things that we must value, whether we value them or not. Now, if that sounds like a strange idea, that's because it is. To begin with, it does, uh, you know, a very poor job of explaining what it is about value that motivates us. Remember, I started out by saying when we think about values, we're asking what, what, is it, what is it that motivates people to act? Agent neutral values, the conception of, of impersonal or agent neutral values, don't really help us in explaining uh, how they motivate people to act because they, they cut out the individual connection, the personal connection between a goal and the agent, the person that, uh, that values. Now, other researchers have, uh, have dealt with this, uh, this question of uh, agent neutral or impersonal values more adequately than I can here, but I'd like to raise a couple of points about it. The most uh, important and most influential uh, political theory today that, that uh, employs an agent-neutral uh, conception of value is utilitarianism. Uh, utilitarianism, of course, being the doctrine that whatever promotes the greatest quantity of want satisfaction or, or happiness, uh, however defined, uh, is uh, the morally correct policy to pursue. Now, just looking at that as an example of, of uh, philosophy employing an agent-neutral conception of value, we can say uh, that, uh, that there are a couple of moral questions we can ask about it. First of all, uh, we can charge this doctrine with, uh, with uh, treating individuals unjustly because unless it happens to be the case, maybe by chance, that my plans, my goals, my projects are those that are endorsed by uh, the, the, uh, the, the utilitarian standard. They, they just happen to fall into the category of that which promotes the greatest quantity of happiness in this case. I have to abandon them. I have to say I ought not to value those things which I value. And I ought to value instead those things which, uh, which happen to be endorsed by this uh, this agent-neutral, utilitarian standard. A second related objection uh, is uh, the idea that an agent-neutral conception of value, uh, such as that found in utilitarianism, violates the integrity of our lives. Human beings are pursuers of value. We identify goals and we act to achieve them. That's what makes our lives meaningful to us. That's what makes our lives what they are. But an agent-neutral conception of value, uh, again, is, is manifested in utilitarianism, uh, violates this because it makes us a tool for other persons. It makes our lives, our energies, our efforts, and so forth, things that are valuable because they are useful promoting the, for promoting the goals, the ends of others. With those things in mind, okay, I'm going I'm to argue for secession uh, from the perspective of normative individualism. Normative individualism simply being the, the, uh, the doctrine that all human values are personal or agent relative in character. This tells us something about political institutions, namely that political institutions are valuable and that we have a reason to support them, only insofar as they're useful, as they facilitate our pursuit of self-chosen values. And a set of political institutions, a state, possesses value for everyone concerned, everyone subject to it, only insofar as it works to the mutual benefit, the mutual advantage of all concerned. So as a test then, or looking at particular moral principles, such as a right of secession, we can ask this. When we examine a particular uh, political principle, would it be possible to get a voluntary agreement on it? Would people voluntarily submit to this rule? Now, contractualism, as a, as a moral test of political principles, uh, the way I'm going to do it here works in kind of a backward fashion. We're going to ask this. Could anyone reasonably reject a particular political principle or rule? If so, if we can understand why someone might reject a particular rule or principle, uh, we can say that it would be unjust to impose it on anyone. Okay, this contractualist test is, is a version of what's known as the principle of universalizability. Uh, there are various versions of this principle, but there's one that's well known to everybody, the golden rule. Do unto others as, as uh, we would have them do unto us. When we approach the subject of justice, we're asking what should we expect from other persons? And the contractualist test, again, as a, as a variant of the principle of universalizability, uh, 
implies this, that uh, what we should expect and what we should extend to others are the same. We should extend to others the same consideration, uh, the same recognition of ourselves as, as pursuers of value, as individuals whose lives has, have meaning to us, uh, the same consideration that, uh, that we expect for ourselves, extend that to others. Uh, so with that in mind, we can ask you, would anyone uh, be able to reasonably reject a rule, a political uh, rule that, that uh, prohibited secession under all circumstances? Certainly, I think the answer is yes. First of all, uh, the contractualist test invalidates exploitative political principles. Forceful opposition to an act of secession by a group of persons seeking their own independence, their own freedom, benefits the state or those that oppose the act of secession at the expense of the secessionists. In this sense, then, opposition to secession becomes an exploitative policy, one that can be uh, rejected by normative individualism and the contractualist test I've described. <coughs> we can say that, uh, that, that anyone could reasonably reject a rule that prohibited secession under all circumstances in view of the fact that, that we can assume, realistically, that there's an inherent uncertainty about the prospects of life under any political arrangement over the long term. It's reasonable to suggest that at some point any of us might become dissatisfied with the political system that governs us and that we might wish to secede. Because future dissatisfaction with a set of political institutions is possible, then uh, anyone could reasonably reject a rule that would lock them into a political system that they might at some point in the future disvalue. The upshot of this is that any state, any just state, should provide a constitutional means for persons to secede from it. Any state that prohibits secession, then, is an unjust one. Now I want to move to uh, defining the right of secession. First of all, I'll ask the question, whose right is it? Now, if you can, in the philosopher I mentioned earlier, treat secession as a group right. The idea of group rights seemed to me to be one of those, uh, kind of like uh, agent neutral values, the idea that only, uh, only an academic could come up with. But a group right is one uh, is defined as follows. It's a right that's possessed by a group and only by a group. It can be exercised only by a group of people. And it exists or is justifiable because it promotes, promotes the interests of that group of people. Typically when people think of group rights, uh, what they have in mind are cultural or ethnic groups. Uh, you know, a lot of the talk about, uh, or a lot of the, you know, kind of multiculturalist dogma that we find on, uh, on college campuses around the country today is based on a conception of group rights. And when we look at the, the concept of secession, you know, we, we can ask, is it necessary that a group who wants to secede be able to identify themselves as a, as a, as a recognizable uh, uh, cultural, ethnic group, and so forth? Is this necessary? If so, there's a problem, because that means that there's, there's a, an additional obstacle that a group who wants to secede has to overcome. They have, that is, they have to say, we should secede because we have some historical claim to this territory, because we, as a group, have been, or as a class, have been mistreated by the state, or because we have some common cultural uh, or, or ethnic or linguistic characteristics that we want to promote. I want to raise a couple of points about this. First of all, it's not obvious why uh, shared goals, common goals, are the only ones that would legitimate an act of secession. It's not obvious why personal goals might not do the job just as well. Let's imagine a hypothetical state uh, in which there are various people or various groups of people, all of whom wish to secede but for entirely different reasons. Some wish to secede to escape high taxes. Others wish to secede to escape oppressive laws. And still others wish to secede to avoid being subjected to ridiculously inefficient public services. All these are different reasons, and they're all connected with, with personal goals, personal values, personal plans, each of which separately seems to be a legitimate reason to wish to withdraw from a state, to find that, uh, or to, to conclude that the state uh, is, uh, is not uh, a value for us. But these aren't shared values. These are agent, relative, or personal values. So it doesn't seem necessary then that we define secession as a group right because it can be tied to individual interest and individual values. Secondly, uh, the fact that group action, that collective action, is required for an act of secession uh, is correct, is, is true. But that doesn't necessarily link it to the concept of group right. If we think, for example, of rights of uh, due process, procedural rights to just treatment by others. Collective action is required to create reliable judicial and law enforcement institutions that protect these rights. But the value of these institutions clearly 
is, is, uh, is inextricably bound to the interests that we have as individuals, not to common goals, but to personal goals. So even if in a collective action is necessary for a group right, it's not obvious that, uh, that uh, individual rights are excluded from those that require collective action to, uh, to produce or to protect. Okay, with these considerations in mind, then I would suggest that we, we understand secession as an individual right, despite the fact that it's exercised collectively. The interests that it protects are individual interests. The values that it promotes are individual values. Its justification lies in a conception of the individual. So we should think of secession then as an individual right exercised collectively by a group of individuals wishing to, to seek their own political independence. Thinking of secession as an individual right promotes uh, an ideal of the self-defined political community. As Professor von Mises put it, the totality of freedom-minded persons who are intent on forming a state appears as the political union. When we think of a right of secession then, we're thinking of the freedom of individuals to define for themselves their own political destiny, the freedom to choose the government which will govern them. As far as the, you know, the, the, some of the practical uh, instruments that, that should be used uh, to enable individuals to define their own political communities, this is, of course, you know, a, a complex technical question, but I just, just to very briefly uh, make a suggestion. Uh, it seems to me that, that the way in which we can say a political unit could define itself within the confines of another and, and you know, thereby secede uh, could be very simple through a very simple two-stage process, okay, one that's found in many American states, namely initiative and referendum. Get enough names on a petition, and you have initiative. That is, you can place a proposal for secession on the ballot. Get enough votes in a referendum, and secession is a done deal. Now, there's no magic number that we can pick out and say what size majority should we have. Right? But there's no, there's no obvious reason why uh, secession should require any kind of a difficult, differ, uh, more difficult obstacle or a higher uh, kind of majority than other constitutional changes or, or a legislative acts. So I would just, you know, as, as kind of throwing out a suggestion, any, anywhere from a simple uh, two-thirds or three-fifths majority in a popular referendum should be sufficient uh, to uh, conclude an act of secession. Now, uh, limits on the right of secession. I suggest that there are, there are two kinds of limits on the right of secession. Both of these are, uh, are, are, are justified or, or you know, understandable because of objections that people in a prospective secessionist state might make uh, towards uh, the secessionist movement that wants to establish a new government. The first is this, that a secessionist movement should be able to, to establish a viable political order one that can make and enforce law over the entire territory that it'll claim. We can think about this in terms of the contractualist test. Uh, anybody could reasonably reject being made subject to a government that would be unable to protect their freedom and property. In other words, to an unviable and therefore useless state. So this would give them grounds for objection to a particular act of secession. It has to be able to, to establish a viable state. Now, as far as uh, defense matters are concerned, uh, this is, a, this is a difficult question. I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but I just want to suggest that, uh, first of all, uh, there's, there's a, a good deal of evidence that shows that states do a pretty poor job of defending their citizens uh, from, uh, from foreign attack. Uh, over the last two centuries, for example, almost 70% of aggressor states have uh, won wars involving major powers. It's not a very good record. Moreover, the, this is, uh, international relations are a kind of uh, uh, thing that are subject to rapid change. Uh, states who are a friend one day may not be uh, you know, the next year or the next few months. Uh, so uh, there, there's a lot of guesswork involved in, in relations among states. So I'll just say this. First of all, as far as viability is concerned, states, uh, a prospective secessionist state should be able to uh, do one of two things. Uh, either uh, be large enough to raise the revenue it needs to provide defensive forces, or at the very least, uh, create diplomatic institutions that it could use to form defensive agreements with uh, other friendly states. If so, then it can claim to be viable as far as uh, its international relations are concerned. Okay, a second, uh, second uh, limit on the right of secession. A secessionist state uh, must favor private property in the market. Must be willing to establish a regime of private property in the free market. Why? Because again, we're talking about uh, erecting a state. And so they're, they're, uh, individuals have to be uh, willing to, to apply uh, this uh, contractualist test of reasonable rejection to uh, what uh, we're proposing to establish. Private property in the market ena enable individuals to pursue self-chosen plans. That's what makes it valuable, right, in light of uh, normative individualism. Secessionists must reject socialism as an economic alternative. First of all, we can relate this to the viability requirement. Again, as uh, Professor von Mises showed long ago, 
rational economic calculation is simply impossible uh, without a price mechanism. It's impossible under socialism. And so, and, and finally, as we've all seen, you know, the socialist economies come uh, crashing down, that uh, socialism is not a, a viable economic alternative. This gives people grounds to reasonably reject being made subject to socialism. But there are, there are, there are more, other moral considerations as well, because socialism systematically prohibits uh, individual choice in, uh, in uh, pursuing career economic decision-making, forming cooperative endeavors with other persons and so forth. Uh, this is what enables individuals to reject socialism as an economic alternative. Uh, normative, indivi normative individualism, the contractualist test that I described, uh, enable people to, to morally reject uh, socialism. It, it's, it's, it's fundamentally unjust in this sense. Okay, finally, uh, you know, so now I've, I've come up with these two uh, limits on the right of secession. Uh, they're, I think, uh, I think not too restrictive. Okay? Uh, as long as we can erect a viable political order, one that, that uh, protects private property in the market, uh, there should be no further obstacles to our right of secession. But uh, Alan Buchanan, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it comes up with a few other restrictions, so I want to just very briefly uh, touch on some of these. Okay. First of all, loss of straight state property. You know, if the state uh, that we want to secede from is, has uh, uh, built roads, other economic infrastructure, and the, the territory that wishes to secede, is this grounds for a uh, for a, a, a opposing a right of secession? This was, uh, of course, uh, in the, uh, the period leading up to the war between uh, the American states. Well, it was uh, also an issue. Uh, one thing we can say about it is this: if there is a, a general benefit among uh, all the people. Uh, involved in both the remainder state and the, the prospective secessionist state prior to an act of secession. That is, if everybody benefits, if it is to everyone's mutual advantage, before an act of secession, it's by no means obvious why people will be deprived of uh, the benefits of this kind of spending later. Uh, roads, for example, and so far as they promote uh, economic growth and productivity, uh, you know, you can drive your car over the road, whether it's uh, on one side of a boundary or another. Remember I said that uh, we, you know, we have to establish a regime of private property in the market. That means that we can't prohibit voluntary exchanges by individuals across uh, boundaries of the remainder state and the secessionist state. So if there's a general benefit, then there's no loss to the citizens of the remainder state, so they have no grounds for rejection or for opposing an act of uh, secession on, on this basis. Of course, uh, real states uh, don't, uh, unfortunately, don't restrict their spending decisions to things that are you know, universally beneficial. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with, uh, with the pork barrel spending and so forth. And you know the, the political process, log rolling, vote trading that, uh, that that promote this, are part of a political system. A political system that, that we may not be uh, necessarily be able to be held responsible for. I somehow don't feel responsible for the system of uh, log rolling that goes on in the U.S. Congress, and I don't really feel responsible uh, for uh, pork barrel spending decisions by the U.S. Congress. Okay, and I don't think you do either. Okay, uh, this is a political system uh, established by political elites. That that, uh, that promotes certain kind of decisions that are not, in fact, universally beneficial. This is just the kind of thing that an act of secession might be, uh, you know, motivate people to escape from. So unless we can assign the assign the secessionists themselves responsibility uh, for uh, you know system of vote trading, uh, pork barrel spending, and so forth, uh, this does not this loss of state property does not uh, offer any uh, reasonable grounds for opposition to an act of secession. Okay, second question. Uh, majority rule. Certainly, one reason that people may wish to secede is to escape a hostile majority. Is there any, you know, kind of special value to majority rule uh, that would uh, enable us to say that uh, that's too bad for the minority? Right? They've lost. Now they have to. Uh, now they have to uh, to live by the majority decision. Secession is not an option. You can, and Alan Buchanan uh, suggests that uh, that's the case. Uh, but first of all, you know, again, looking at uh, the, the idea of normative individualism, it tells us that the value of political order. Uh, the value of majority rule included uh, depend uh, on their usefulness to the individual. Uh, majority rule can be a useful means for collective decision, but it doesn't have any in intrinsic or special value. Uh, certainly no agent neutral value to a majority rule. And so this provides no reason uh, to limit secession. Uh, again, if secession is a, a means by which people can escape a majority tyranny, then uh, majority rule by itself uh, doesn't give any reason to oppose it. Okay, next uh, questions of uh, territorial sovereignty. You know, when, when a group of uh, persons secede, the state loses some territory. And on the face of it, that seems like an objection, a reasonable objection to an act of secession. Uh, the state, the, the remainder, the citizens of the remainder state have lost something. But does this give them uh, moral grounds to oppose an act of secession, the fact that territory is being lost? Uh, Buchanan asked this question. 
right? You know, how can the secessionists uh, claim authority and control over this territory? Uh, how can they say that this territory should be theirs rather than uh, that of the, the, the state they're trying to leave and the citizens uh, of the remainder state? Uh, how can the citizens show this? And uh, again, Buchanan suggests bringing the concept of group rights that they need to be able to show some special relationship to the territory. You know, a cultural tie of the group, a historical tie to the territory, and so forth. Of course, you know, we, we've rejected that now, so, so uh, what do we have to say? Well, uh, the authority of a state, uh, you know, clearly is uh, some of the considerations I've advanced, uh, is derived from the value that it, uh, that it has for the individual subject to it. The territorial claim of a state has no meaning and therefore no validity apart from the value that citizens ascribe to the state and apart from their free choice in deciding which government will in fact govern them. So once the state loses the, uh, the, the acceptance of its authority by secession, it also loses its territorial claim. Too bad for the old state. Finally, uh, are there alternatives to secession? That is, are, can we find alternatives that would be just as morally appealing as secession is? Okay, two alternatives that uh, Buchanan considers are nullification and group veto. Uh, both of these were, were ideas that were discussed, uh, again, in the United States in the 19th century. Nullification meaning that in a federal system, uh, the federal units, American states, for example, could nullify or simply refuse to recognize the validity of uh, acts of the national government. Group veto being uh, John Calhoun's idea of concurrent majorities, that is that, uh, that, that, that people should, uh, uh, that, that different groups that are going to be affected by a rule can exercise a kind of veto power over the rule. Okay, a veto power over legislation that will affect them. Are these replacements uh, for an act of secession? Certainly they're, they, are, uh, they are valuable elements of a political constitution, but what, are they replacements for secession? Uh, you know, if so, then a right of secession is not uh, uh, so strongly justified because we could say, well, you know, we can replace it with something else. You can suggest two criteria. First of all, uh, in, in making this decision, first of all, the independence that a right offers is better. How much independence do we gain by having a right of secession on the one hand versus a right of uh, nullification or group veto on the other? So independence then, one criterion. A second, uh, disruption. That is, how disruptive is the exercise of the right? How much uh, of a problem does it cause to other people when we exercise our right of secession or nullification and group veto? All right. So and you can't suggest that we need, to, we need to, to weigh these considerations against one another. Okay, sometimes you suggest, for example, that uh, the disruptive effects of, uh, of an, a particular act of secession may be so great that they seem to outweigh uh, the, uh, the independence that uh, the right offers uh, to its bearer. As a result, he says, the choice between uh, these rights is indeterminate. Uh, in response, okay, I would suggest that uh, very clearly we should weight independence, the value of independence, over that of disruption. Why? First of all, otherwise, people can be locked in to a, a political order that they disvalue. But this is precisely what I was saying, that, uh, that contractualism and normative individualism enables them to reject. So we get a strong hint from what we've already talked about then, that uh, independence must be uh, weighted over disruption. Secondly, uh, normative individualism tells uh, individuals that, that morally they can stand up for themselves and, uh, and reject calls uh, for them to abandon their own goals on behalf of the goals and the interests of others. With those considerations in mind, then we can say that secession uh, and uh, the, the, the criterion of independence that is connected with should be ranked over nullification and group uh, group veto. Okay, secession then uh, is uh, is uh, essential for any just constitution. Nullification, group veto, not uh, not uh, suitable replacements. Okay, to conclude, I've talked about the limits on the right of secession uh, to uh, erect a viable political order, one that uh, establishes a regime of private property in the market. The upshot of the argument is that all states should provide a peaceful means for persons within their borders to secede and establish a new political order for themselves. Not war, not destruction, not violence and death, but a constitutional right of secession. This is required for any just state. Thank you.